Hi guys, I'm Jack. And I'm Mary. And we're from Chasing Landscapes. And today we're gonna to take you on a journey with us through a piece of history of the United States. And one that may be forgotten. And uh, it should never be forgotten. Right. And uh, we're gonna take you back to World War II after Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor how we treated Japanese Americans in our country and what their life was like. We found a place where they were encamped right here in Cody, Wyoming. So we would like to take you there today. What's the name of the place? Heart Mountain. Heart Mountain. So we're gonna take you there with us. So please join us. Thanks. And like and subscribe, at least subscribe. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We're going to go and see their museum and find out a little bit about what happened to them. So we're on our way there right now, okay? I wonder if they have uh, grave sites for anybody that passed away while they were in the car site. Interpretive Center and Museum is over here. This is one of the guards' towers outside the encampment. This map shows you where the 10 camps were in oh, the United okay. States. If you were in a camp, you were from the West Coast. Many of the people that were in this one were from uh, Southern California. Yeah, we lived, I used to live right by Santa Anita Racetrack. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I think that might have been a um, where they sent oh, them to be processed, seven. right? So the new part that you kind of seen when you drove in is this addition, the Mineta Simpson Institute. This is a really good article on that. Okay. Norman Mineta was incarcerated here as a boy and he met Alan Simpson through the Boy Scouts who came out to the camp. They became lifelong friends and then also were in politics together, but bipartisan work throughout their lifetimes. Um, we're gonna start you with this little section. It's pre-war information. It's gonna tell you kind of the mindset of the country before Pearl Harbor happened. Mm -hmm. Then once Pearl Harbor happened, Roosevelt enacted an order and we went to war. At that time, the Japanese were pulled from their homes, sent to processing centers, which were usually racetracks, fairgrounds, and then they were gathered together on trains and shipped to the various camps. They all got a government number, that kind of thing. There are two terms you need to know, <clears throat> Issei and Nisei. Are you familiar with those? No. Okay, an Issei is an immigrant Japanese person, so they had moved from Japan had been living here, had businesses, homes, maybe worked for the railroad and agriculture, mm -hmm. um, and they had children, the Nisei or next generation. So they were born here, so American citizens, but both generations were put in the camps um, after we entered the war. I was American and I 
love my country and I love my flag that uh, the general population didn't view us in that way. The guards were watching you and the spotlights would follow you at night. We had to pull down our shades in the uh, trains, especially when we came to a populated city or something. They said it's for our protection because maybe some of the people in the community might throw rocks or bottles at us, so we had to pull down the shades. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people came from California, so they were not prepared for this weather. They could only take the clothes on their back in one small suitcase. So that was, this is quite a different climate from California weather. You can see that right there. Coming from California, we were dressed, you know, for California weather. It was really cold. Gee, the minute we would step outside, it was so cold. We had those pop bellies, so we would, we would always go out and get a lot of the cold warm. This is what they found when they arrived. This was their barracks area. Not much. Here's all of their belongings. I guess that was for beds, cots. And over in here, was how they made it their home. Quite different. They built their furniture and because so many of them were in one room together, they had to share a lot of space together, a small space together. That's one of the things about the Japanese spirit where you just endure and that's what we did. My son Ross was born in Harmaki. My dad died right in camp. I graduated from Hartmont High School. We got to really keep this busy. One of the gals in our block said, well, I'll fix you up. So she fixed me up with this fellow. And uh, we went to the same conference dance, and it turns out that I ended up marrying him. <laughs> when I turned 18 in Heart Mountain, then I became eligible for the draft. I was quite surprised to find that there were 63 of us out of Heart Mountain. We then had uh, resisted the draft notice. The thing about going to jail, I figured we were already in jail behind our wires, so what difference does it make? My brothers, three brothers, and, you know, were drafted or enlisted. You know, they were willing to uh, give their life to prove that we were Americans. Mm -hmm. We just did what anybody our age would do. Play football, basketball, base kind of, you know, cards and things like that. But we never discussed the fact that this was a, you know, massive denial of human rights and to take us without any due process and put us in, you know, these camps. And we went to the front gate, you know, everybody gets 25 bucks and a ticket, that's it. And so, you know, you made out with what you had. We had nowhere to live. We stayed at a friend's house. We might go to Twin City areas. I think we'll come to New Jersey. Or maybe we'll go to Cleveland. And then my parents found a place in West Los Angeles. When the war was over and we came back, everything was stolen. So we had to start everything from scratch. It was the 10 years after camp that was probably the hardest. is because we came out with nothing. I remember being spit on, and I remember this woman 
looking at me and calling me a yellow jack. Well, we hope that it never happens again. Here's a map of the relocation center, all the barracks. There's nothing that we can do to change the mistakes that we made then. But in 1948, Congress provided $38 million in reparations and 40 years later paid an additional $20,000 to each surviving individual who had been detained in a camp. Sometimes, though, no amount of money can replace the pain and suffering these people endured. Here's some of the families that were kept here. Okay, it looks like these are a couple of the barracks that I wish we could see inside of there. This is the outside of them. There's Heart Mountain over there. Can you imagine coming here from California and having clothing suitable for California, but not here? It's cold here right now. And uh, thankfully we have the option of bringing warm clothing with us. They didn't have any idea of where they were going or what would happen to him. Yep, there's another building. This smokestack was left as an icon for this historical place, and better yet, as a reminder of what happened here. The 100th Battalion out of Hawaii and the 442nd Battalion from places like Heart Mountain became the most highly decorated battalion in U.S. history. They risked their own lives fighting for the American way, even when their fellow countrymen were still incarcerated. All in all, 800 men and women served the U.S. military from the Heart Mountain encampment. And harboring no bitterness, this gentleman served the United States Army, was the Secretary of Commerce, and then became the Secretary of Transportation. If that isn't dedication to your country, I don't know what is. So unfortunately it's starting to rain, but this was very fascinating and disheartening. So we can't do this walking tour here. Here's their encampment. We hope this video gave you some food for thought. Thank you for joining us. Do you have a question, comment, or suggestion? Please let us know. We like talking to you. We'd sure appreciate you liking and subscribing to our channel. Be sure to hit the notification bell and please share, share, share with your friends.